I think you might have to say that you know that there's a recording happening. It'll pop up on the screen. Nice to see everybody. Just letting the last few Thanks. guests join. He's in the meeting. <laughs> So we've got a great panel of speakers here this evening to talk us through some of the questions and conundrums and uh, most recent research that's happening in the area of plant populations. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining us. And um, like I said, if you didn't hear, just got some more people arriving. It'd be great for you to introduce yourselves on the chat and let us know where you're joining from and what's brought you here today. Um, so over the next hour and a half, we'll be delving into the question of how we can diversify our approach to cereal breeding in the UK. And within this, we're going to explore it from different perspectives, but with a particular focus on the the development and use of genetically diverse plant populations. So these are non-uniform cultivars that cannot currently be registered as varieties. So a brief bit of background is that ORC pioneered this work in the UK with the development of ORC Wakelin's population or, or YQ, as it's known. And that has been going on for some time now. Just going to mute people. Uh, I'm muted. And, um, but there's actually a lot more to this topic. And we've got a great panel of speakers that are going to introduce us to some of these different perspectives on the need, potential, and drawbacks of working with plant populations. So please try and keep yourself muted throughout the webinar if you can, just because it helps with not get the presenters too distracted. Um, and if you've got questions, please put them in the chat alongside saying, who you are, where you come from. Um, and we're going to have quick clarifying questions after each presentation, but lots of time for discussion at the end. Um, so we'll delve into the more detailed questions then. Please do uh, let us know where you're joining from on the chat. We only got one message so far, so don't be a stranger. <laughs> um, and do send through the questions so we can have a bit more of an interaction and discussion at the end. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to now pass over to Nick Fradgley, who's going to kick things off. Um, he's going to share some context of where we are at present with cereal crop breeding, the challenges that may lie ahead, and the role of evolutionary breeding and populations within that. Nick's work focuses on crop genetic resources for applied wheat breeding, and he's recently completed a PhD on the genetics and breeding for wheat milling and baking quality. Previously, he worked with diverse cereal populations at ORC, and he's been developing non-commodity cereal crops um, as a pastime. <laughs> so, yeah, it'd be great to hear from you, Nick. Um, do you want to kick off your presentation, please? Thank you. Okay. Oh. Share my Everyone see that okay? Perfect. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, kind of the background of, of work that I've been doing since I've been, I was working with uh, the YQ populations at ORC. And I've added in a series of unexpected results, as a lot of the kinds of findings I've, I've, um, I've had since then in the research hasn't been what I've expected or trying to find, but it's really added to quite an interesting story, I think, which I'm going to try and explain. Okay, so firstly, uh, to kind of look at the, the value of genetic diversity um, for, for crop breeding, so I'm going to mostly kind of focus on, on wheat here. Um, one of the big projects that we were part of at NIAB uh, was looking at a diverse magic population, which is kind of uh, made in a similar way to something like the YQ uh, population, um, where it has multiple founder uh, varieties that were intercrossed to uh, uh, create the population. This wasn't done over uh, four kind of uh, levels of crossing. So that has a much uh, higher rate of recombination to create the, the population. So we chose these parents to capture as much diversity as, as uh, possible in, in the 
or kind of UK and European wheat uh, diversity. So you, um, by, by doing full kind of genome sequences of the, of the parents, we could then compare those to uh, kind of a reference panel of, of global uh, wheat diversity from a different people and look at kind of how, my, how many of the genes uh, from genetic markers have, are captured in these 16 parents in comparison to uh, kind of different regions of the global Europe or Northwest Europe or, or the UK. So we found that we did pretty well in, in that we kind of captured more than kind of the average diversity that you expect in the UK. And it was pretty representative of, of Northwestern Europe. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of what we'd expect. We, we, we kind of captured a good amount of diversity in just these 16 parents. And then once you kind of looked into the details of the of the gene sequence analysis to look at how many kind of different versions of each gene at the gene level uh, there are, how much diversity for each gene there is, we found out that 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 could be uh, kind of captured at a remarkably low number of haplotypes or kind of allele versions of a gene. So mo nearly all genes have only have two or three haplotypes at each site. So that's actually a very low kind of level of diversity uh, at a single gene level, which is that's the first kind of odd result that we got, which is kind of unexpected. So there's, there's not a lot of diversity in the, in the kind of background of, of the gene. But then despite this kind of low diversity, you look at kind of breeding uh, the history of wheat, and you can see that breeders have actually been quite successful in at increasing yield despite that only being a limited gene pool. Uh, so you look at kind of wheat yield gain uh, trends over the last 70 years, and it's been pretty linear just in the, kind of the genetic increase in yield. Uh, and another interesting example, even more kind of clear, is there was a really interesting long term experiment that happened. Uh, well, over 100 years ago, that started in 1896 in the a long term Illinois maize selection experiment. But they started with one single uh, kind of outcrossing population of maize and they just selected, uh, did a recurrence selection for high protein content every year. And they, I think they expected to kind of see after a few years it might level off and it might reach the kind of the maximum kind of uh, potential of the population. But they've been going over 100 years and they still keep getting a linear kind of increase, much longer. Okay. Yeah, you keep, yeah, they, they haven't run out of diversity because they can keep increasing the, the phenotype, phenotypic variation. So, this that's a, kind of a bit of a paradox because if you haven't got a lot of diversity, how do you keep increasing a trait? Um, and then you can even look at how much diversity. Uh, how, how, or how the kind of trend in diversity has changed in, in the UK wheat landscape. So this is another kind of analysis I did, looking at the genetic relationships among these are pretty much all the major wheat varieties that have been grown in, in the UK in the last about 40 years. And then look at the proportional acreage of these varieties, of, kind of how much of these have been grown in the UK every year. So you can kind of get an idea of the, the colours that are shown here that relates to which branch of the tree they're in. So you can kind of see how the diversity of wheat across the UK has changed in well, that's 30 years. And getting in kind of a measure of the, of the diversity of the landscape of wheat, and that's actually been increasing rather than decreasing. So that's another unexpected result. So there's something odd going on here that there's not a lot of diversity, and it's actually getting more diverse, but breeders are, are applying a strong selection to and um, keep getting genetic gain without kind of depleting the genetic diversity there, which seems to be increasing. So my kind of take on um, on how and why this is happening is that more complex um, uh, that, that well, genetic models are more complex than, than we think. So um, another kind of uh, analysis that we did with using this magic population, where once you kind of you can build a model that um, relates to uh, the genetic components to the, the phenotype, the trait, so you can predict the phenotype from uh, the genetic variation. So I kind of did a simulation study to kind of simulate what would happen if you just kept on selecting for high yield within the population, 
in a similar way, similar way that uh, like the long uh, maze long term experiment was. But with because it's a simulation, you can change the kind of parameter of parameters of the genetic model to assume different um, kind of genetic uh, architectures of the trait. So for this line here, that's that's kind of assuming a simple genetic model where there's only a few genes that are, are working additively or independently. Um, and you can see that things plateau quite quickly. You run out of diversity and you, you, you get stuck. You don't get any more progress after only a few cycles of, of selection. But if you assume that the genetic model is more complex and there's a lot of there's more kind of uh, interactions between the genes and they're kind of working synergistically in uh, complex networks, you see that there's much more potential for kind of adapt for progress to be made. And then you can see that when you look at this is uh, kind of the changes in the frequency of genes over the course of selection. So in a simple model, the major kind of genetic effects are fixed quite early. And then after not many cycles, then you run out of kind of useful genetics that can be used for selection. But here in a complex model, there's a lot going on here with the, kind of the background small genetic effects, which are kind of optimizing the kind of interactions. But it's those kind of that later stage in the selection which explains how you, you that you still get kind of progress in, in selection. And that's much more um. Uh, reflects what you what we see in, in real life in breeding programs that you can still kind of get progress in, in breeding just despite um not having a lot of genetic genetic diversity to play with so yeah, i think that yeah that's quite an interesting uh, explanation of what's going on so what's happening i think is that recombining existing genetic diversity is as effective um to generate new phenotypes as the overall genetic diversity of, of genes in the first place. And this is because genes rarely act independently and are expressed in complex regula regulatory networks um, where the number of possible genetic combinations can be very large with only a few genes in a network. So if you use an example of if you have a handful of genes that are of a, um, each only has two versions, if it's too early, if they're in a network um, where, they, uh, where they're interacting, if you only have 10 genes, there's more than a thousand kind of combinations of these genes that, that you could have. So it's that kind of level of, of different combinations that actually uh, comes, comes down to um, variation in, in the trait uh, for that can be selected. So yeah, this phenotypic variation is actually only really unlocked when genes are effectively recombined in a population, and it's a lot of long-term kind of recurrent selection. So, so uh, uh, for those kind of effects to evolve, um, and that's what yeah. So coming back to how that's relevant for um, for evolutionary breeding populations, the kind of variation and um, uh, from adaptive potential of populations is going to be really interesting considering how we can bind they are and how long they've been so under natural selection in different environments but if that doesn't all make sense then i thought it comes quite down, nicely down to a quote from jurassic park where life just finds a way of the american so uh, evolution kind of can kind of work despite um quite narrow parameters okay. So in the second kind of part of the talk that I want to um, talk about is um, the potential for for breeding to um, uh, or for breeders to breed varieties of phenotypes that are more resilient to climate change. So this was a one part of the, my PhD work where I looked at kind of um, some long term uh, field trial data. So it was four more than 400 field trials going back 20 years. Uh, so there's loads and loads of phenotypic data to characterize the phenotype. And then I use some genetic markers and pedigrees and environmental covariates and so on whether to characterize genetic and, and kind of environmental components of all of these uh, varieties and, and trial environments. So then you can build a model that kind of uh, models the, in, the interaction between genetics and environment 
so then that that key part of trying to uh, determine whether a particular variety could respond differently to the environment because it's interacting with, with the genetics and then relate that to future climate projections to see if you know how the environment is going to change so um yeah so once you have a, a model that can predict a phenotype from a, a genotype to environment interaction i then look you can kind of add in the kind of new environments from the climate projection so from this i'll use a well, the climate projection from the Met Office, which goes up to the end of the century. Um, and obviously, uh, it takes into account the increased temperature uh, from climate change. And this is kind of the overall trend that we're going to see in the UK, where, like in January in, in winter, there's going to be actually an increase in rainfall and an increase in temperature. So it's going to be warmer, wetter winters. And then in, in summer, there's going to be quite a lot less rainfall. and uh, increased temperatures. So we're going to get hotter, drier summers and warmer winter winters. So then when you can kind of plug those in environmental data into the model, you can then um, kind of get a prediction of what the, the, the phenotypes for, in this case, protein content would be all over the UK in what is kind of the, the current normal environment, which is kind of the average year from the last 20 years compared to what you see in, in the future uh, for the scenario from 2050. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the actual values that you see across the UK, and this is a, a, kind of the difference. So actually, yeah, when you kind of look at the difference, you, you see that in the southeast, you're going to see a negative um, kind of predicted effect, where you might get lower protein content. But a lot of the rest of the UK in the north and the southwest, you might see a more positive um, effect or, or kind of climate impact. So it's kind of a mixed a mixed bag in terms of what we're going to expect for climate impacts climate impacts for quality. Um, but that study was only looking at um, the quality traits. So I should also mention a uh, yield in the UK. So this is looking at a different data set where I looked at the national um, the national yield trends, and this is going all the way back to mid nineteenth century. So this. Yeah, a good couple of hundred years of, of data here. So this is yeah, and this so obviously the trend in, in yield increases as people start using a lot more fertilizer in the from the nineteen fifties. But it's a, the year to year kind of variation around this trend is what's interesting, which you can kind of pull out from that here. So you can see which years were particularly high or low yields. And then when I relate that to the climate data for each year. The only kind of strong um, correlation you find is with rainfall in July, and that's actually a fairly kind of weak negative correlation. So in drier years, you actually get higher, there's been higher yields. Um, so that's another yeah unexpected result that actually climate change for for quality and, and in this case yield um, might be um, fairly positive in the UK. I think that's because we're we're high up enough in latitudes that um, uh, an increase in temperature and probably kind of, uh, if it's if it's raining less, you get more sun and it's going to be a better kind of growing period in July. So um, but yeah, but that's become the overall trend for what the average year would be in the future. But then we're actually more concerned about what the kind of year to year variability would be um, and how. Um, and, and how um, is there potential for them for the for breeders to make a variety that's more or less sensitive to that, that year to year variability? So this part of it, yeah, the model, so the part of the model that models the interaction between genetics and the environment, you can kind of uh, you can show this by these kind of plots, which is a kind of a linear line. Um, from the genetic response to an environmental gradient, in this case, from an increase in temperature. So the difference in the slope of the line is the kind of sensitivity to the environmental change. So the flat of the line, the more stable that that phenotype is to the environmental gradient. So then, once I did that for hundreds of of potential varieties or genotypes in hundreds of simulated future kind of year scenarios. 
when you look at the, how how variable the slopes of the lines are, there's actually very little difference in the slopes that you could predict from um, these kind of models. So that's again that's a of a big unexpected result. I was hoping to find that there's lots of potential that breeders could use to to kind of um, make resilient, adaptive, adaptable varieties, but it seems like there isn't. Um, so what I think that comes down to is another quote uh, from Anna Krenin in this time from the Tor study. This is the Anna Krenin principle, which comes from the intro of uh, the book where it says happy families are all alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And this was related quite nicely to crop breeding by Heslot um, a few years ago. So in the context of crops, when genes hunts perform poorly in a, in a given environment, it can be due to many different stresses and deriving general results is a daunting task. So I think that relates quite well to what I found that there's so many different ways um, of kind of scenarios that can happen in a year, it makes it really difficult to predict any kind of use, useful kind of gene type environment interaction that breeders could use to breed a single variety that is more resilient. But that's what's really important, I think, for populations where if you can't predict a single um, uh, variety that's going to be more resilient, it's better to, to just have as much diversity within the same population. Um, that would say they can face your bets in uh, if the if the following kind of year is going to be unpredictable. Um, so finally, yeah, a summary of the, of the points that I'm trying to make. So breeders have somehow managed to keep increasing genetic yield within a narrow gene pool, and they've done this by recombining a limited set of varying genes that interact in complex genetic networks. So the amount of recombination of pop but population, I think, is as important as the amount of genetic diversity that's in the population that gives it that gives the population an adaptive potential. Um, so kind of more practically, I think it's important to create new populations from uh, lots of crossing to maximize that recombination rather than just making mixtures, which doesn't effectively uh, create that adaptive potential. And then the general climate trend will actually be mostly positive I think for wheat yield and quality in the UK um, but then breeding single varieties is going to be difficult that are resilient um, to year-to-year -year variability but again yeah imp importantly for populations uh, the recombined diversity and adaptive potential of populations will be extremely useful tool in the toolbox for breeders um, so that's yeah that's my take on it take on it all Thanks, Nick. That was a whirlwind tour of your PhD and all the work yeah. you've done in the last however many years. Yeah, um, sorry, I'm going to time a bit. That's okay. I, I didn't. I didn't tell you to stop because we have got a buffer at the end, and we haven't had any questions through yet. Um, and I think it was really good to cover all that to contextualise what we're going to delve into in a bit more detail. So, um, if you stop sharing your screen, mm -hmm. we're going to pass over to Henny. Um, she's going to share some results from some recent ORC research. Henny's the crops researcher at ORC, and her recent work has focused on trialing modern heritage and population crop varieties in organic and low input systems at field scale, um, working with a network of farmers across England. So over to you, Henny, and we'll think about how the different things that Nick's been presented actually apply when it comes down to farm level performance. Yeah, thanks, Charlotte. Can you all hear me okay and see my screen? Yes, it's working. Good. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so like Charlotte just said, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, population performance uh, on organic farms in full field scale trials. Um, so the results that I'm going to be sharing with you are from five years of trials. So two years were from a live seed project, which is a Horizon Europe project, Horizon Europe project. And then three years of the results are from uh, Live Wheat, which was a DEFRA funded project. Um, so these were farm based full field organic winter wheat trials. Um, so this project kind of recognised that cultivar testing and information 
that was being provided to organic farmers wasn't entirely relevant to them. Um, it was based on information from trials that had been carried out in conventional systems. Um, and so the kind of general objective of live wheat was looking at how to improve organic and low input wheat performance, um, but by using information gathered from these, um, yeah, organic trials like on farm to provide some more relevant information to organic farmers. So this just gives you uh, a bit of an overview and a, an idea of the farm network over which the trials were carried out. Um, and as you can see there across England. Um, and this gives you a bit of an idea of the experimental design um, from the project. So these were field scale trials. So they were carried out in strips of the field rather than um, plot scale trials. And um, on the right here, you have an idea of some of the varieties that we were testing. So we were mostly looking at modern varieties, but we also included some heritage varieties like Maris Widgeon and um, YQCCP, so the population. Uh, we use Siskin as a control variety. So this variety was present across all of the, the trial farms. So during the trials, um, we would go and carry out assessments uh, twice during the year. Um, so we collected data from each of the variety strips. So we'd be collecting data on the agronomic performance indicators. So we'd be looking at vigor, height, um, weed cover, different weed species present. And then we'd also be collecting data on the yield and the grain quality at the end of the season. So going into the results now, when we're looking at agronomic performance, so you've got y, um, YQ at the bottom there. So this is just a snapshot of the results. If I try to include all the varieties that we looked at, then it would cover certainly a lot more than um, one slide. So what I've done here is I've just selected a couple of varieties to kind of compare the YQ to. So X days was uh, one of the best performing modern varieties. We've got Maris Widgeon, which is a heritage. And then we've got Malika, which is another modern variety that performed very well and is actually normally spring sown. Um, and so when we're looking at the productive uh, performance of YQ, what we see is, uh, so the X's in the box here, um, those suggest that the variety was significantly, um, showed significantly kind of higher performance than the control variety Siskin. So what we saw that YQ um, showed significantly higher protein, uh, specific weight and nitrogen harvest um, compared to the control Siskin. It did show a slightly lower yield than the Siskin. And then when we're looking at the agronomic performance, it showed significantly higher crop cover um, and height at both growth stage 32, so at booting, and also at anthesis, so at growth stage 65. Um, so during the trials, we had two years that had uh, particularly dry spring and summers. So we kind of classified these two years as drought years. And we also kind of looked at the varieties and how they performed specifically in those drought years. Um, and we found that uh, YQ performed kind of the same as in still performed significantly better in the same areas as it does in the non-drought years. But we found that the yield wasn't significantly lower than the Siskin. Um, so now we're uh, going to look at uh, grain protein deviation. Um, so in wheat varieties, there's a what's called like a yield protein trade off. So generally, as yields increase, protein decreases in wheat. Um, but we wanted to look at whether varieties showed something called grain protein deviation. So this isn't that they showed necessarily the highest yield or the highest protein, but that they showed um, higher yield or higher protein than what would be expected. Um, and so we compared the um, kind of grain protein deviation compared to Siskin as our control. And we found that the historic variety, Maris Widgeon, um, did show this grain protein deviation. So it showed higher protein than what would be expected from its yield. Um, we found that YQ showed some grain protein deviation, but not that was significant. 
Um, and so then we also looked at weed cover, um, which is in organic systems, obviously a very important uh, factor. And uh, as you can see, YQ here highlighted in pink. So YQ showed significant uh, weed cover for both um, all weed species, but also for competitive weed species. So that will be like your thistles and uh, your docks and uh, your rye grasses as well. Um, so it might be spoken about a bit in a bit more detail later on, but there have been some questions around populations and um, how they perform in terms of disease resistance. And so I wanted to include this slide to kind of give you an idea of how YQ performed um, in terms of diseases compared to other varieties, um, especially those modern varieties that obviously have been bred um, a lot for that disease resistance. So actually what we see is YQ sits pretty much in the middle. Um, it didn't have huge levels of disease like your thia and your evolution. Um, but yeah, so sort of middle ground there. And the same for the green leaf area, which again is a bit of an indicator of how much disease is present. Uh, so we also looked at dynamic stability. Um, so for the varieties that were present um, across at least three of the years, we looked at um, their dynamic stability. So this is how well a variety performs compared to the environmental uh, mean of that year. Um, so the dashed line that you see here, that would be the control. So that would be, for example, how Siskin performs in that year and then how well the variety um, performs compared to Siskin over all of those years. And you can look at it over this environmental gradient. So if a cultivar um, kind of has a significantly flatter slope than the control, it's um, said to have significant dynamic stability. So that suggests that it's more resilient in those low performance environments. And it's considered a sort of, yeah, more resilient, uh, more resilient cultivar. So this gives you an idea of the, sorry, it's a bit of a um, overwhelming slide, <laughs> but this gives you an idea of the dynamic stability of um, some of the varieties that we looked at. Um, so we've got X days here, which is modern variety, um, which did show good dynamic stability for um, quite a few uh, areas. So we've got yield and specific weight and some of those agronomic um, indicators. But we also see good dynamic stability from YQ, again, for protein and specific weight and that crop cover and thesis, as we saw before. Um, but what we found was really interesting is that we um, highlighted those drought years that I explained before. Um, and dry springs and dry summers are, are possibly, well, quite likely to become more um, prominent in future years it's with the kind of climate projections that we have um, I think it's quite likely that we'll see drier springs and drier summers so it's actually really interesting for us to look at how these cultivars perform in those kind of environments um, what we see here is that YQ um, showed dynamic stability so better resilience in terms of grain yields and grain protein and also nitrogen harvest but we also see here Maris Widgen, which is a historic variety again shows dynamic stability for yield but also for those agronomic indicators that we've seen. Um, so I appreciate that was a bit of a whistle stop tour through um, our results but if there are any um, questions then please do put them in the chat but yeah just to go through some of those conclusions so with YQ the end use is sort of outside what's the kind of usual classification in terms of milling and feed and groups um, which is potentially one explanation for the sort of lower yields that we see here. Um, as we saw, it had really good grain quality and showed really good agronomic performance in terms of vigor and weed competitiveness, which is obviously a really important trait for organic systems. Um, we didn't see significant disease pressures in the population. And when we're looking at that dynamic stability, so that resilience over changing environments, we found that especially in those drought years, um, there was this real support for diversity delivering resilience to environmental stresses. Um, so where do we sort of go from here? 
I think that further on-farm trials are really important, um, would really help us to kind of validate these current findings. Um, and it would be really great for us to trial other populations other than YQ. I think it highlights the use of genetic diversity and how it could be a tool to offer resilience to those future climates, as it is showing this stability across environmental stresses. And it also kind of highlights this historic cultivar Maris Widgeon. It performed really well, um, showed good dynamic stability, um, showed grain protein deviation, and uh, yeah, really suggests whether there might be this need for kind of a rediscovery of historic cultivars for organic system breeding. And that's everything from me. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Henny. It's a really good overview of the work that's happened over the last five years on the with our work on organic trials. So um, we'll pass straight over to Ed in the interests of time. Do send over any questions on the chat. But for now, Ed, um, just to briefly introduce you, you're a lecturer in crop physiology at Harper Adams, but also working on developing populations and non-commodity grains in at your family farm so yeah, yeah. I'll try and share my uh, screen it's going to blow up again hopefully not success. Can we do the slideshow? Yes. There it comes. Hey, we're cooking on gas. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. So thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit, I'm going to change the subject slightly. I'm going to talk about barley at first because that, that was my introduction to, uh, to plant breeding and then I'll go on to some wheat as well. So I've been using population breeding in barley and in wheat special type of barley, which is naked barley, which is barley for human food. So we grow a lot of barley in this country and it, it really does very well in our climate, Low, lower inputs than wheat, but we eat very, very little barley directly. Um, we obviously use it for, for beer and whiskey, which are good things to do, but um, shouldn't be really encouraging um, it, um, even more consumption. So one of the problems with barley is You've got to dehull it if you're going to eat it and that's where you get pearl barley what we've got here but where barley is traditionally used as human food is naked barley uh, naked barley is naked because it threshes free from the husk it's ready to use um, so you can flake it mill it into flour it tastes delicious and there are lots of good reasons for wanting to eat barley it's high in beta glucan, which is a type of soluble fiber, which can help control cholesterol and also um, moderate blood sugar levels, which means you don't get the spikes of insulin and then develop type two diabetes. So if we start using barley as food more than we do, that would have um, big health impacts as well. So I got into this when I was at Bangor University and then carried on uh, while I was at uh, uh, Harper Adams. And one of the, the issues I found is that there the are very, very few available varieties of naked barley and none of them bred for UK conditions. And it's a bit of a market failure. The, the big breeders are only interested in what is going to give a return. So they need a big market. There's no real big market for food barley at the moment. So it's not worth investing um, in generating new varieties. So I started doing some crosses myself. And the other thing with naked barley is it opens up a whole load of diversity that wouldn't otherwise be of interest to uh, UK or European breeders because they've been trying to breed for low beta glucan for beer quality, low nitrogen, and some of these um, more exotic varieties, they may have five or 6% beta glucan rather than 3%, which would find in a typical malting variety and they may have two and a half percent nitrogen which works out as about 15 and a half percent protein so we've got a, a an Ethiopian 
uh, black naked barley on the side there. So the, the process of making a cross is actually reasonably straightforward. You just have to remove the anthers with the tweezers while they're still green before they can uh, self-pollinate because barley and wheat, they are naturally self-pollinating. So the, the plant has the male and female parts. So you remove the male parts, the anthers, while they're still green before they've dropped any pollen. And then you, a couple of days later, you dust on the pollen from the, uh, the one you want to cross it with. So making a cross is relatively easy, but it's what you do with the, uh, the progeny afterwards. The 20th century method is the pedigree method, where you make a cross to get the F1 plants. Then you've got the F2 plants, usually two to 3,000 of them, depending on how many traits you're trying to, uh, to, to capture. And then you'll start to um, pick out some of the best ones in the F2. And then they'll become families in the F3, the F4, the F5. As so they go through the generations and self-pollinating, they gradually become more and more inbred and they're gonna grow more and more true. And then the, the, the breeder can start doing selections and um, generating what will become new varieties. Problem is with this system is it's quite slow. It's also very expensive in terms of room and um, labor. And it's really out of the question for my little um, sort of literally back garden breeding efforts. Um, a more modern system would be using marker assisted selection where you're using genetic markers um, rather than the, the phenotype of the plant. But again, this is, this is expensive. You need to generate the markers. You need labs and all that sort of stuff. So there is a, an alternative low input method of breeding. And this was used quite a lot by John Whitcomb at Bangor University, his, his group, the Ashoka rice varieties. And it's a method of bulk breeding where you make fewer crosses. Um, you get two really good parent varieties, um, cross them together, and then you do mass selection on the uh, lines. So this is one of the uh, mass selected populations. You go through in, in the, uh, instead of growing individual plants at the F2 stage, you mix them all together in a, uh, in a, a bulk plot. You go through the plot, weed out anything you don't like, select anything you do like. You can do positive mass selection where you where you're selecting the ones that you do like, so the uh, the naked grains, for example, and then you can go through in later generations and weed out anything that's maybe too tall. So what we've come up with is lines of naked barley that look a bit like varieties, in that they're reasonably uniform in height, they're reasonably uniform in time of flowering, and they're yielding well, better than the uh, the available varieties naked barley, but you'd never be able to get them through any sort of um, DUS testing, so distinct, uniform and stable. So any variety to get on the national list to be able to market the seed, it's got to pass the DUS testing, where the inspector has to look and see, is it distinct from current varieties? Is it uniform, which is what it suggests? And is it stable? Is it going to grow true year to year? Um, so they'll look at the different phenotype characteristics. This is from quite an old um, NIAB book, but this is the sort of thing they're looking for. And they're looking for every plant to be identical. Whereas, uh, yeah, at the, whereas, whereas my lines are, they look sort of identical, but a DUS inspector would soon pick them to bits. So one route I've been going on is having these lines as mass selected populations and just accepting that they're not going to be uniform because who do, uh, why are we wanting them to be uniform only to get through, through the testing? And there's, there's many benefits of being more diverse. And in some ways, I've also increased the diversity by taking the best ones and mixing them together. So now I've got an oak farm population of uh, naked barley. So because I was doing this work in the background, um, this sort of hobby breeding, we managed to get a couple of years ago, uh, we got um, Horizon 2020 funding for a project called Crop Diva, which kicked off in the autumn of uh, 2021. 
So we've had one, one field season so far. Crop Diva stands for Climate Resilient Orphan Crops uh, for Diversity in Agriculture. So we're looking at six different crops. One of them is naked barley because it's been neglected in Europe because we're not using barley for food. And so I'm using some of my lines in testing and we're also testing, there's about 300 different accessions from all around the world and we're doing some pre-breeding work on that as well. One of the things we've been doing is trying intercropping these. So what worked really well last year was the, the naked barley, um, my naked barley breeding populations mixed with uh, peas. And you can see it kept the peas standing very, very well. We had samples of stones in the uh, in the sole crop peas because they all went absolutely completely flat as peas do. Whereas the uh, peas sown at 100% of their normal seed rate and 30% of the barley seed rate, that stand, stood beautifully. It was like a 3D basket work. Um, and so it kept everything standing. And interestingly, we found that there were significant effect of barley variety on the yield of the peas. So some barley varieties played better as um, companion crops with the peas. And one of the, the best ones was one of my uh, breeding lines we're calling Oak Ruby, which is uh, quite a short, stiff sort of breeding line. Also did some fungicide trials and the Oak Farm population of naked barley, which is the uh, a population made from a mixture of some of the different crosses that had the smallest response in yield to fungicide. So it was obviously showing better disease resistance. If you want to um, follow what we're doing, have a, have a look at the Crop Diva project. I've got a, um, a little link there and there's also a Twitter page for, for Crop Diva. So there'll be more things happening over the, over the summer. So that's what got me started off in, in plant breeding is that to try and fill the gap and that we didn't have any decent um, naked barley varieties. But through that also got me interested in wheat. Um, so what we've got here is a, a land race wheat, um, orange Devon blue rough chaff. This is one of the uh, forgotten land races, or certainly they were forgotten until the work of uh, John Letts and Andy Forbes. But you've heard it mentioned in the, the previous presentation about Maris Widgeon. Well, Maris Widgeon was from a, a, long, a longish line of 20th century wheats. What happened in the 1870s onwards is farmers started growing really more square heads wheats, which are low in protein. And the millers were preferring the Canadian hard red wheats. So what plant breeders did at the beginning of the 20th century was decide to cross them together. So you get the square heads wheat crossed with the, uh, the Canadian red fife, and that was Yeoman, and then Holdfast, and then Maris Widgeon in the 60s. So that was from that line. But it meant that the very good bread making quality land races like Red Lammas got forgotten about. So they haven't featured in any modern wheat crosses. So that got me interested and I started crossing some of them together. So these are modern wheats crossed with the land races like Red Lammas and Orange Devon Blue and Hen Gumro. And I was doing the same thing again, keeping them as mass selected lines, keeping the diversity in there and then very much inspired by uh, Martin Wolf, I decided to see what would happen if we mixed them together as well. I've got some pictures here. Uh, one of the other crosses we've got here is Corazan wheat, which um, is sometimes is sold under the trademark Kamut. It doesn't grow very well here, but rivet wheat grows superbly here. So cross them together and you get a, some of the quality of Corazan, so good pasta wheat. But again, keeping the diversity there, the, the seed heads are different shapes and sizes. It would really um, give a, a DUS inspector nightmares. So why, why am I using this diversity? What use is it? Um, why not just stick to modern wheats? These are a couple of pictures taken in 2018 on some very light sandy soil. We've got a modern wheat there, just given up, turned white. Whereas the, the population from a, a, a cross with uh, a land race and the modern wheat, you can see it's still got green in there. There's still a fiery color in the straw. It's still alive. 
So it's just hanging on and finishing properly. And we did find it a lot better specific weights and better proteins. Does it work with yield? Well, we know YQ is very, very good for in terms, uh, sorry, in terms of disease resistance. Well, um, I mixed together um, a load of my crosses, about 20 crosses, so a lot fewer than um, Wakelin's YQ, but a strip at the side of the field, same fungicide program, completely clean versus um, pretty, pretty dirty from a modern wheat variety. We've had several wheat varieties broken down in recent years because of changes in the septoria population. And of course, where you've got a diverse mix, um, then it's more resilient in face because you've got to have a strain of the pathogen that can overcome all the genetics in the population, which is very unlikely. But this is Oak Farm population. Again, I uh, sort of remixed it. So we'll have to see in the, on the next slide, but again, Top three leaves from Oak Farm population, fairly green. Top three leaves, this was from Firefly, which was one of the varieties that broke down um, last year against Septoria. And then again, a DUS inspector's nightmare. This is Oak Farm population, 20 different um, land race and modern crosses. And also we've got some material like Holdfast, which is one of the parents of Maris Widgeon in there, um, in, the, in the crosses. And you can see it's got a double layer of, of ears. So I deliberately remixed it. So it's got about 10% tall ones, so they can act as a, an extra layer, um, uh, capturing sunlight without shading out the majority of the ears below. But it's not as tall as that, that picture I showed earlier with the orange, dead and blue, which is about a metre and a half, two metres tall. This is about a metre tall um, and stays standing a lot better. But just, fin just to finish off with, one of the, um, the best things about this journey and uh, non-commodity grains has been, been the people, the end users, people getting together and looking at how we can explore more of a grain chain. So we had the uh, the big UK Grain Lab meeting in 2018, we had another one last year, even uh, more well attended. And so it's really great to have a, um, a more of an interest in um, the grain for what it is, the celebrating its flavour and its provenance and everything else. So um, sorry to uh, put you in the photo there, Charlotte. But, uh, so that's that's been the uh, the good thing about the about the journey. Okay. Thanks, Ed. Really nice to hear all the different things that you've worked on and been trying, and um, hopefully we'll carry on to develop as we move forward with our quest to diversify cereal breeding. And it's really nice to have that nod to the people involved. Um, and the networks involved and it leads us perfectly on to Georgina <laughs> who is going to be talking about her work with the Southwest Grain Network. So we've spoken a lot about the kinds of varieties and cultivars that are out there and how they perform but how do we get these different types of cereals out onto farms and do we need different approaches for that? So Georgina has been working to establish um, regional growing networks in the UK as part of a wider food systems transition and is currently working at the University of Edinburgh, co-producing an action plan for the Scottish government to support grain networks in Scotland. Drawing on her experience at the Southwest Grain Network and being part of UK Grain Lab. So over to you, Georgina. Brilliant. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, yeah, so I'm going to touch on or delve into sort of the participatory side of um, what was a phrase that I'm seeing more and more frequently, participatory plant breeding. Um, I'm going to talk kind of more generally about what participatory methods are and why I think they're important um, and quickly walk us through two examples of projects I've been involved with to do with diversifying grain systems that are trying to make use of participatory methods and then learnings that we can draw from these um, and then I hope to kind of draw a bit of a parallel between um, populations uh, so uh, wheat populations and participatory methods 
Um, so briefly, participatory methods are basically processes mainly used in the fields of research um, and design in which communities that are implicated in decisions um, are considered the co-designers and the co-researchers um, rather than the subject matter of research or the target of interventions. And these methods attempt to address the hierarchies in uh, kind of power structures and decision making um, that usually exist in systems um, and to increase the diversity of perspectives that contribute to knowledge creation and decision making. So this slide hopefully briefly illustrates um, kind of some of the differences between participatory and non-participatory methods. So non-participatory methods, um, an example could be considered the kind of more traditional academic research system um, where communities might be studied from the outside by a researcher and that researcher um, kind of translates their findings and acts as a sort of gatekeeper of that knowledge creation um, to translate this into kind of learnings that institutions can take to impose um, kind of uh, implementations top down on those communities. Um, participatory methods, by contrast, see loan learning as uh, part of the development process and every agent within the system benefits from learning from one another. So the relationships in the system are more networked, um, so they're less linear and extractive, they're more networked and multidirectional. And the knowledge that's created sort of emerges from those bidirectional relationships. And the decisions that are made um, about communities are made by communities. So participatory methods are important because they produce more robust knowledge bases for research and intervention. Um, the inclusivity of the methods tends to build better trust with communities and ensures that there's a greater element. Of, uh, so there's greater buy in um, of implement of uh, sorry, interventions um, in the communities that are affected by those interventions. And the first example of a project that I want to look at um, uses participatory methods to inform policy. So this is the um, five and a half month project to co-produce an action plan for Scottish government around um, the development of grain networks to help transition the grain system in Scotland. Um, so the it, this has been funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. Um, and it's been led by a team at the University of Edinburgh in collaboration with stakeholders from the Scottish grain system. So um, participatory methods have been used throughout this process. Um, kind of most notably, we held a workshop at the beginning of, of the process um, and invited stakeholders to participate. And um, as a result, came up with what became the kind of backbone of, of the report that was produced, sorry, skipping ahead there. Um, but I think it is worth noting that there was a hierarchy still present in, in this process. So um, Edinburgh University kind of sitting in a leading role and administering the funding here um, meant that some decisions were taken by the university. Things like the final sign off on the draft that went to print um, and the team at the uni basically acted as kind of synthesizers of all of the input that was that was coming in. Um, so this slide hopefully brings this project to life a little bit. Um, so on the left, we've got photos from um, various visits with stakeholders, um, stakeholders who are involved in this project. And on the right at the top is the photo from our um, one day facilitated workshop. Um, and this group of stakeholders includes farmers, we have bakers, um, there's uh, individuals from NGOs kind of involved in the food system, um, researchers, got organic researchers, got uh, nutritionists. Um, so there's there's a whole variety of people there. And the result of this day was this target that you can see here and a roadmap, which I'm, I'm not going to go into in detail, but these basically went on to form the backbone of the final report for Scottish Government. Um, and they were a result of this facilitated workshop. Um, so I'm going to jump straight on to the next example, and then I'm going to uh, kind of draw the two together um, with some conclusions or some learnings that I've taken from both projects. 
So the second project um, uses participatory methods in a uh, kind of amateur crop breeding project that's happening in the Southwest Grain Network. Um, and this is an ongoing project to produce a population wheat for bread baking that's suitable for uh, the growing conditions in the Southwest, but also um, that the bakers are happy with in terms of the bakeability of the grain um, or of the flour that's produced and the taste. So there's a mul there's kind of um, a lot of different people have been involved in this project since the beginning. But really core cool is um, a farmer, Fred Price, who um, back in 2018, along with another farmer, Cole Gordon, um, put in a request to a seed bank for 8,000 uh, different varieties of grain. And they've been planting um, these out year on year. I think they introduced 1,500. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, new varieties into um, some grain trials every year and then select um, at harvest those varieties that have done best in the system. And it's been running for about five years now. Um, there's, as I said, there's kind of an ever changing group of people involved. Um, we've since replicated the trials um, on further patches of land. Um, it's a self-funded project, meaning that everybody who has been involved has had the time and the finances and the motivation um, to participate which obviously has some limitations on the accessibility of this project and the diversity of, of perspectives that have fed into it um, and on the outcomes, so on what we've been able to achieve. Um, and the processes have been informal, but I, I would say there's been a high level of um, kind of use of participatory methods. And um, as this quote, I put these in the wrong, wrong uh, order, as this quote will kind of... Um, highlight those participatory methods weren't planned, but they've turned out to be a very important aspect of the project. So this is Fred, the farmer who is leading this project, really. Um, and he says the community or network or participation at work uh, aspects weren't a goal as such, but it's become clear to me lately how essential those components are. They are a prerequisite of all the other aims. And this slide just shows um, the grain trials that we've replicated on a market garden just outside of Bristol. Um, and this one down the bottom here, we roped in a lot of different uh, bakers to come and help with harvest. Um, up here is Fred. Chris is a researcher at um, the Centre for Agroecology and Water Resilience in Coventry. And Humphrey is a market gardener. And it's been interesting, actually, to see the arable farmer and the market gardener learning um, different skills from one another that have, have really helped in um, making these grain trials happen. Um, so I just want to cover some things that I've taken away from both of these projects about participatory methods and how what's important really in implementing them and how they can better be supported. So the first I want to talk about is decision making, um, which was uh, quite an interesting one for me. I think um, I hadn't really given much thought to how decisions are made, I think, um, before getting involved in participatory projects. Um, I think when you're coming from relying on hierarchical structures, um, it can be quite overwhelming to have a whole diverse range of perspectives in a room and to try and find steps forward. Um, and from my experience, most of the people who've been involved in these participatory methods haven't had any formal training in different types of decision making. So the, the difference between consent and consensus, um, where it can be useful to use voting, and where hierarchy exists. And so to me, that would be key to uh, kind of increasing people's involvement in participatory methods is providing training and decision making. Um, Skilled facilitators are key. That's something that I've learned uh, from my involvement in both these projects. Um, again, it's the bringing of diverse perspectives into a room is really important, but making sure that that is a productive um, and I think positive experience is really down to having people with, with facilitation skills in the room. Um, a note on power, power structures and power imbalances. Um, I found that it is actually, I think it's quite difficult to remove all, all power structures. Um, but I think where they exist, it's important to make everybody aware of them. So make them explicit. 
um, and and discuss them openly. And then the exercise becomes um, more consensual. So people are choosing to be involved with the project, understanding where decisions might, the power to make decisions might lie. Um, funding, so external funding is key, I think, to all of this, to making these processes inclusive. Um, they take a lot of time and they take these skills, so decision making and facilitation. Um, and we certainly could not have done um, the project up in Scotland without the funding, the five and a half months of funding um, for a full time position, the position that I, I was working um, without that ESRC funding. And the final point um, that I kind of want to end on really is this trade off between diversity and efficiency. So the point of participatory processes, to me at least, are reintroducing diversity into the social systems that surround our food system and that surround the decisions that are being made. Um, and this is really important for the same reasons, really, that it's important, I think, um, that we reintroduce diversity in the genetics of the crops that we're, we're dealing with. But diversity and efficiency are always a trade-off in a com complex system. And you'll notice this in participatory methods because they are not always efficient. Um, coming to consensus amongst diverse perspectives is not a is not an efi time efficient process. Um, and so I think that that speaks back to the funding point that these processes take time. And I up, I've been involved in in these projects, one of which um, has had funding available for that time, another hasn't. Um, and so. Yeah, there, as I've said, there have kind of been limitations on who can be involved in that project. Um, and then I've just included a quote here um, that kind of sums up the point that I just made around the trade off between diversity and efficiency in a system. Um, and it comes from the book Donut Economics by Kate Raworth. Um, I'm not going to read it out now because it's quite long, um, but it will be in the slides. So if, if Charlotte shares them um, with, uh, everybody afterwards, then I, I recommend reading it because I think for me it really brings to life that um, that trade off. But there we go. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. It's really nice to bring in that social perspective to the discussion. Um, so, last but not least, I'm going to pass over to Bruce. So Bruce has been working in this area for probably more years than he cares to remember. Um, firstly, working as um, head of research at the Organic Research Centre and now um, kind of a mixed role. He's here as Furan Consulting, which is his new consultancy business, but also has a role as Director of Science at Garden Organic. So Bruce is going to talk about a specific piece of work that he's been um, working on, looking at the published scientific research on plant populations. And this is really to now contextualize all these nice ideas of what's what's possible with populations, how they can bring in and support many different aspects of the food system transformation that we've been exploring. But what is currently out there? What's what's been done with them, and what evidence do we have that they're working? And how can we make the case to policymakers of their value? Over Thank to you, Bruce. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, yeah, I'll. Um, it's been interesting hearing the rest of the talk. I'll um, I'll cover some of it and then make some comments probably on it. But yeah, as Charlotte said, I've been doing a piece of work which I'm about three quarters of the way through. Um, which is uh, really a, a a rapid evidence assessment of the literature. So um, I think what I need to put in the first place is what was I defining as a population? And I went back to the uh, the European uh, marketing experiment where they said a population needs to be one of the following techniques. And to be truthful, most of which we found within the, within those experiments and within the literature is really looking at this crossing of five or more varieties in all combinations. Um, there are other ways of doing it, so, uh, and I think Ed's talked about some of them and probably it's come up in some of the other uh, talks today about actually growing at least five varieties together and letting them cross fertilize naturally, if you like, without actually doing th those sort of specific crossings. And there's a third way, which is actually um, using um, protocols from one of the other two 
or both the other two above. So um, that's how I've been sort of looking at it. Um, when you've looked at actually what came out of the populations and actually what came out of marketing experiment, uh, there were 52 uh, applications on it, 46 were then authorized and uh, overwhelmingly they were wheat. So there were five maize, three barley and 41 wheat. Uh, and there were no oats. So the, the marketing experiment wanted looked at those four different uh, um, cereals. So uh, as I sort of expected to find in the literature that I would find a lot more on wheat than anything else. So uh, I got in system, went into Google Scholar, uh, and I decided we should look at referee papers, conference proceedings, and practice abstracts. And uh, I it was um, looking at from the end of wheat breeding link is that right charlotte yeah which was 2013 so it's what's been published in the the 10 years 13 to where we are now um and there, there are clearly other publications that have been before that particularly the early work we did on uh the the yq and the other populations we produced well we we worked with john and centers and produced they were actually first produced in 2001 so by 2013 because of the way things worked, they were about at an F14 or 15 at that point. So um, I looked at, but the search terms were either wheat, barley, oat or maize, and then with either population or CCP, and I did a specific search for uh, wheat wakelands population. Um, there was not a huge amount of, uh, of papers came out of it. Wheat had about 25 plus. And, and actually, most of them were research using the, the YQ CCP. Um, there's a lot of work being done, uh, coordinated really through uh, Germany, through um, Maria Frink's group, uh, which is looking at, at those populations. And I'll touch a little bit on that in a moment. Barley had quite a few more. Um, and there was only, at the moment, I haven't done a complete search on oats, but I could only find one on my initial search. And there's about five plus it, it with maize. Um, so actually, what value do are, are we finding in the literature and populations? I think Nick's come up with some really interesting uh, information and comments, which actually may challenge some of the things I'm putting here. And um, similarly with, with Ed's uh, information. But actually, I think some of the problems we have is that actually most of the research, when you look at particularly on wheat, on the CCC performance, is on the YQ. So we actually have a single population that is informing a lot of this information and actually it's very clear that actually the performance is based on the parental genetics so uh what we had um within <clears throat> the yq so that was actually a mixture of both yielding and quality uh varieties but actually what we saw is that actually high yielding genetics in a population formed better than low yielding ones that doesn't that's not surprising. When we did the initial work looking at the, the Q population and the Y population and the YQ, the, the quality did uh, did perform poorer. And that goes back to uh, Henny's comment or Henny's presentation about this trade off between yield and, and quality. Um, we also saw um, actually yield differences between organic and conventional conditions. And so that's not surprising. We saw that within the work while well, I was still at ORC, but actually the Germans are also finding this. And actually, if things are grown under conventional conditions, um, that actually uh, they perform poorer than, um, sorry, let's start that again. If they're grown under conventional conditions, the conventionally bred cultivars performed, outperformed the, uh, the CCPs. Um, but under organic or low input conditions, the uh, heterogeneous material, so the CCP of the wheat yields, were actually comparable or superior to modern pure line varieties. So again, that's nothing for, for the information that's come from ORD and, for, and from the other information here that actually, that's sort of backing that up. Um, but also we saw a, a better yield stability um, within the CCPs. Um, there's the work I've started to look through on the barley, and again, this there are very there are a few populations on that um, coming out of uh, Eastern Europe, um, but actually there's similar findings where we found in with barley. So we're finding uh, populations in low input systems are produce are better than single varieties, and uh, and also when we're looking at um, foliar disease and resistance, we're again seeing um, CCPs have. Um, either equal or, um, or slightly less, but actually the, uh, the resistance to foliar diseases are quite similar. So if, you, so if you're looking at in organic systems, we know that um, it, there's a raft now of information coming out and some of it was presented earlier that, that actually for diseases, they work very well. 
Um, and actually, so the work that was uh, by Whedon in 2001, who, and she's part of the, um, uh, the Castle Group. Um, so they're, they're moderately resistant to brown rust, and actually we're finding even some uh, uh, resistance to the emerging uh, striped rust races that were coming through in 2011. Um, and actually, if we're looking at some of the work that uh, Thomas Doring would publish while he was at ORC, again, this sort of backs that up. But again, when we're looking at diseases, again, it comes down to what the parental lines are. And so uh, we know that it was a reasonable mix within uh, the ORC population, but actually, can we do better? So um, some other information we have. Uh, so actually, um, the, the German group as part of, uh, it was an earlier project called COBRA, um, actually looked at their cycling experiments, which was co coordinated by uh, Germany, uh, but actually had uh, consistent input from Hungary and the UK, and the UK partner was ORC, and they were using the YQ population. Um, and so within this, one of the CCPs, which was IQ, was grown by each partner for one year and then subsequently sent around to the next partner, thereby creating the cycling of the CCPs. And actually, that so these, these cycling populations ended up having um, quite vastly different histories, and it was a five-year experiment. Um, what we do know from that information coming out of that, actually, that the CCPs remain relatively similar to one another for most agronomic parameters. So uh, there's a paper I'm working on with a wider group on that, um, which we're trying to pull out a bit more information on that at the moment. So um, what do we have and what do we need? I think it's still difficult to tell. Um, a number of the, uh, the the CCPs and the heterogeneous material um, with the market experiment from across the Europe. So we had what I think it was forty eight. I think we came into there. So there's lots out there. A lot of that hasn't been. Uh, it's difficult to find precisely where they came from. I could dig back. I need to dig back more into what the EU information is. But actually, there's not a vast amount being published on them. Um, from our experiences of our C marketing and maintenance of the CCP, so the YQ, um, it's difficult. And we know we need more engagement from, from the industry as a research institute. It was actually very difficult to do it. Um, and it, it sort of went um, through uh, uh, Kim at uh, the Real Food Bakery. And actually, so she took it and actually ran with it and others have been working with us. So actually things like with an artisanal bakers and it can be used as a marketing tool or as a um, they know how to work with it and want to use it. So. Um, if we're going forward and we want more heterogeneous materials or populations, is that who would gen who would generate this and actually why? Um, there could be a question here about, um, and I think it's come out from a number of the other talks about how we um, there is a uh, there's a value to this and actually whether it's with bakeries or whether it's brewers or distillers um, that there could be a premium product, um, but actually that's fine but then is actually is there an easier way of marketing it where we've marketed it uh, where we we're at ORC during the marketing experiment it was actually quite difficult how do you keep the uh, the, the basic stock going how do you bulk up um, how do you make sure it's not changing too much um, so actually are there other ways we can do that is there a way of having a marketing club so whether we all own it all those sort of things I think what we have found from here, though, is actually uh, coming out of the literature and the other conversations today is that there are benefits for resilient farming systems. Um, but I would post the question, and I think Nick has come up with some interesting answers to it is actually, but would mixtures be a better uh, or as, uh, sorry, would mixtures be as good or a more easy to manage way of diversity within farming systems? Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> If everybody that's uh, been a speaker would like to come off, we'll have a, we've got about five minutes for a little discussion at the end. Thanks so much for your presentations. They were all really interesting and have highlighted some of the upcoming issues and questions and ongoing um, research areas that we need to address. I think uh, Bruce's kind of final contextualization of what is actually out there highlights that this is still quite a small area. Um, <laughs> So my question to everybody, but I'll go straight back to Bruce firstly, is what would you think is the next step if we want to try and get these populations more out there to market? We have focused a lot on the policy being restrictive, 
but is it just about the policy or is there any other levers that we think we, should, we need to focus on to really mobilize the use of them? I, I think it's a, for me, it's a lot of a number of these policies that we can be hidebound by the policy and actually there are ways around it. So I think with actually, um, if there are uh, groups of people wanting to come together, a CCP or a population isn't too difficult to produce. And actually, it, we there's possibilities of bypassing regulations by keeping it within a club, if you like. But again, it's actually how do we, um, it, it's then looking at what populations you might want for any one product. So having kind of... Um a clear idea of the social structures that will support the use of those populations to really make them work. I guess like you reflected on the, it was hard to get industrial buy-in when we first started out trying to market YQ. Um, and it's about sharing risk and it comes down to uh, Georgina's comment about uh, participation. And it was really, to be truthful, literally the week we went out commercial, we went out with marketing of the YQ, I realise we're probably doing the wrong thing. <laughs> so Georgina, what would you say would help really outscale the use and support the growth of um, the use of populations, but also diversifying how we approach our research and our methods to exploring how we can have a more diverse food system, really? Just a big question for a, a short amount of time. <laughs> First, unsurprisingly, I would say that participatory methods are important here. Um, I think, I mean, at least for me, as someone who is um, sort of aware of the overarching reasons for use of populations, but is not knowledgeable uh, in kind of crop breeding at all. Participatory, participating in the, the breeding trials in the Southwest has been a way for me to start to understand some of the barriers to, to kind of crop selection and to really basically bring me in contact over and over and over again with um, the kind of difficulties that farmers like Fred are facing in finding crop varieties that work in their systems and that work with their values. Um, so, but in order for participatory methods, I think to be used, there is, there is a massive knowledge gap and there's, there's not much uh, funding or um, that I know of out there to kind of support um, the use of them. Um, so I suppose that's what I would say is kind of um, more strategic support for enabling people to get involved in these processes, um, including things like access to facilitation skills um, and kind of and funding for things like even just the transport to be able to get to events or to field trials to be able to participate. Um, that would be my two cents. Great. Thank you. Um Ed, would you be able to share some reflections on what you think is holding back the development and use of populations in UK cereal production systems? Well, the, there, there is a regulation aspect, but probably the, the biggest one is the end users. And that is slowly being overcome on a, on a small scale. So obviously... Um, Kim at the Small Food Bakery, Champion YQ, that was a, a, a big thing. Um, whether we'd ever get YQ or similar populations into the, uh, the big bread brands is probably very, very unlikely because it's, it's their, their, their business model is consistency. So they, they get a variety that they like and they stick with it. And they're mm -hmm. trying to kind of produce a consistent product. Um, but the more and more we have the, the local networks, they, they're ideally suited for more of the, uh, the population type approach to breeding. Yes, great. And Nick, how about um, from your point of view, I guess you've made a case for, based on your research that there's a role for them to play, but how big do you think that role is? And is there a balance between all the different types of markets and end users? Would that help to define where we should target our efforts for population development? Mm. Um, I think, yeah, I think, I think I found myself agreeing with, um, with Ed there. That the kind of the, uh, yeah, I can't see the, kind of the big breeders starting to breed populations or the big millers starting to 
run it through you know, big mills. Um, but it, it, yeah, I've seen, um, yeah, the last, yeah, 10 years has been a huge, well, there's been a lot of progress in the uptake of number of farmers using it and bakers using it. But I think those kind of production and kind of demand for it really needs to be, or has been very balanced so far. I think I'll be, yeah, and I think one can't, yeah, we shouldn't be producing more than we, anyone can, isn't going to be able to sell. So I think it's, it's, I think it's kind of happening slowly and steadily. Great. Really, yeah. It's a kind of a gradual build up of uh, experience and uh, yeah, people, people working with them. Even though you have a strong case there for why we need it in the face of climate change, it still seems like it's going to rely on a bit of a grassroots movement to kind of uh, get that um, mobilized at scale. Yeah. Yeah. Henny, we have a case there for the use in organic systems, but it's not uh, always straightforward. You you said we need really more trials to validate how they are performing um and on on farm trials are really powerful in that um so what would you say would be the kind of focus for if you were developing a population for an organic production system based on the results that are coming out of live wheat um i think that's a very good question i think you could go lots of ways with it i think what the trials kind of highlighted for us was that what we have now in the kind of uh, what traits are kind of offered up to farmers for them to pick from are, are based around their kind of disease profile, which is obviously very important. And modern breeding has done fantastic things in making a lot of those varieties um, very resistant to diseases. But I think what we've highlighted is that we now need to kind of expand the traits that we look for. We need to focus on um, like early vigor. We need to focus on um, like weed competitiveness we want to look at that stability that we talked about in terms of dynamic stability um, how they perform in drought conditions so I think yeah just kind of obviously using the traits that we already look for is a really good base but then expanding that um, and looking a bit wider and um, not just for organics but obviously there's the rise in kind of regen and low input so they're also going to be interested in those traits it's kind of not just not just for organic so yeah great thank you so much everyone we'll have to close now but um thanks for everybody thanks for the the, the chat um and your contributions and ideas that have come through on there we're going to save the recording and it'll be available later and we'd love to hear from you if you have any thoughts after the event about future research questions to really drive forward the use of populations and also getting involved in um consultation that DEFRA are currently doing around expanding the legislation to allow for the continued marketing of genetically diverse cereal seeds. Okay, thanks everybody. I'll close the meeting. Um, but thanks again to our speakers, really interesting presentations and uh, have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>